Hey everyone, welcome back. So I realized I haven't done an introduction of myself since I've started the YouTube channel. I know that the people on the other group on Facebook know who I am and my story. So on this episode, we're going to do a little introduction of me. If you haven't done it, please hit that like and subscribe button down below and that little bell notification icon and stay tuned. I go by the name or nickname Trip. Um, I got that back when I was 18 years of age, living in Wisconsin years ago. Um, it had to do with smoking weed. Um, you know, a lot of teenagers smoke weed, and especially back where I was at in the town that I was living in. And whenever I would smoke weed, I would get, uh, you know, I would, I would just say absolutely off the wall stuff, and everybody was like, oh man, you know, you're such a trip. And it just kind of stuck. Um, had nothing to do with uh, hallucinogens, uh, which is ironic because later on in life I, I did do some hallucinogens, um, but I'll talk about that some other time. So I grew up um, watching my mom have domestic violence committed against her, a little bit of it committed against me. I uh, saw some really horrible things, everything from guns, knives, I watched somebody push, try and push this, her face into the side of a wood-burning stove that was red and uh, watching the skin on her hands come off when she was released from it. I, I've seen some bad stuff. Um, we had to get up in the middle of the night a lot of times, pack what we could into one or two bags, and then uh, just move, right? So. I, I had been East Coast, West Coast, uh, North, South. I'd been all over the United States. I spent a couple years living in a tent on the side of a mountain in California. And that was cold in the wintertime. Really cold. Um, I, I didn't know it till later on that I was hungry, uh, especially in California. I always just knew that come dinner time, uh, I was always, like, my belly was just always, like, rumbling and hurting so bad. Um, so, I, you know, I, I saw a lot of stuff. But somewhere around the age of 10 years of age, I, I started thinking that my life isn't supposed to be like this. You know, I'm supposed to be in school. I'm not supposed to move in the middle of the night. You know, I'm supposed to have friends. And over the course of the next couple years, uh, it kind of built. And I, I got tired of my mom being who she was. I mean, I would ask her, why do you allow these people to treat you this way? Or why must you be with a man? Why can't you just, why can't it just you be you and me so I can go to school? And, you know, she was so codependent that it caused a lot of issues. At the age of 12, shortly before I turned 13, I packed up my, uh, what I could into about two bags. And I had a neighbor uh, from where we were staying, uh, take me to the juvenile detention facility in Mobile, Alabama, and they have a courthouse there. And I walked right into the front doors of the courthouse and told the deputy that I had just run away. So they processed me into the system. Um, I was waiting on the court date for my mom to come and explain to the judge what's going on in her life, why, why I left and walked into a government facility uh, seeking help. And she showed up to the, the courtroom an hour late, intoxicated. The judge had already awarded the state the temporary custody or partial custody, uh, but ended up being custody for the rest of my time as a juvenile. I ended up spending time in two group homes. Both of them were actually pretty decent group homes. I was really surprised because I'd heard stories. 
And um, then later on, I was taken home during uh, a Christmas visit with what was called a visiting resource. Visiting resources were people who volunteered to take uh, kids that were in group homes on the weekends. And they had grown fond enough of me to want to take me home on a more permanent basis. So between the age of 13 and 18, I was in, uh, I was in foster care, but with a really, really good family. I didn't really consider it foster care. They treated me like family. They were my family, still are to this day. Um, and, uh, you know, really good people. So at the age of 18, I got out of foster care. And I just, I had this weird feeling I needed to go up to Wisconsin. That's where my grandparents were living. My biological grandma and my, my step-grandfather who had been married to my grandmother longer than I had been born. lot <laughs> longer than I had been around. And so I moved up there, um, just drove up there not letting them know. And, uh, and two months later, they were both killed in a motor vehicle collision in the middle of Nowhereville, Wisconsin, right? So I was alone. For the first time in my life, I was alone. I didn't have anybody to fall back on. Um, I was having to do it on my own. I, and I was not a stable person myself. You know, I bounced around from job to job. Um, I stayed in other people's apartments to begin with. And then later on, I got my own apartment for the amazing price of $300 a month, all utilities included. Uh, good luck finding that nowadays. And, um, I spent a couple years up there. I had a girlfriend and I did bad things. I cheated on her with like numerous other girls, not really understanding what was going on inside of myself to be able to realize what I was doing to that person. And, you know, to this day, I'm, I'm, I, I do feel extreme remorse for that. I mean, but there's, unfortunately there's nothing I can do to take that back. Um, at the age of 21, no, 20, I joined the Army. I, this was before 9-11, back in the year 2000, and uh, they had these really small contracts. So I joined the Army, ended up in the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg, and uh, later on I got a, a letter in the mail from my mom who had cancer. And I went and saw her in England for about three weeks. I realized then that when you're dealing with somebody with a lot of trauma and unresolved issues and insecurities that it's like dealing with somebody with uh, some form of uh, like, like mental illness, like they're not right in the head, okay? And I had to kind of see her that way and like no matter how much I loved her, no matter how much I wanted her to be the best that she could for me, she couldn't. And that realization was was pretty deep, right? So in late 2002, I got out of the Army, and um, I ended up um, getting with my now ex-wife, and we had a kid. And in 2005, I uh, began my career in law enforcement in the state of North Carolina, in a local town just outside of the Fayetteville, Fort Bragg area. And um, I spent about four and a half years there. Um, went through a pretty nasty divorce. Um, I'm not going to say it's the other person, all the other person's fault. I mean, I had my own issues too. I didn't realize that I had PTSD and it was causing um, me to clam up or wall up uh, against a lot of stuff. So due to the... Uh, divorce and everything that I went through, I ended up leaving the state altogether. Uh, my son still lives there with his mom. Um, and he's 18 now. <laughs> he just turned 18 uh, this, this past December. Um, anyways, so after I left North Carolina, I ended up in Omaha, Nebraska, where I ended up in a nightmare scenario. I'm not even going to go into it, but I mean, it was a bad scenario. My, my codependency, my need to be with somebody was so bad, I ended up being with like a true sociopath. And uh, the things that I ended up doing and, and enduring were just, uh, that's, that's one story I really don't like to talk about a lot. Um, 
after about four years in Omaha, I didn't have anything going on. And my codependency caused me to link up with somebody down in the state of New Mexico that had contacted me on Facebook. So I came down to New Mexico, and um, that was probably a really low point in my life. Um, I was a very broken, damaged individual. And unfortunately, when you're broken and damaged like that, you have a tendency of hurting other people around you, even if you don't want to, right? Because inside of our own heads, we often think that we're okay. It's everybody else around us, right? So the other person I was with uh, wasn't an angel by any means, but probably didn't deserve some of the things that I had said or done. And, I mean, I didn't do anything, like, terrible, but, I mean, just just my overall behavior and judgments and everything. Um, but what it ended up doing is it ended up exposing me to psilocybin, which, if you know what it is, that's great. If you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. Um, but I ended up uh, diving into that pretty deep, and um, it helped alleviate a lot of the traumas that I had. So, um, as my traumas went away... I began to dig for deeper answers into life. I was at a point in life where I thought that God hated me, the universe was out to get me, and my life reflected that, like the, the bad things that happened on a regular basis, and you know, I didn't want to live this way, so I started digging for some like really, really deep answers, and you know, I came across people like Sadhguru, Adishanti, uh, Rupert Spira, uh, Muji, you know, like all these other spiritual leaders, and I started to notice a pattern between everything that they were talking about. And I did more research, dove into uh, Eastern philosophy and spirituality, um, which led to other forms of spiritual practices. And I started to see the same, the same repeating pattern. So I began to put two and two together, did some deep research, and um, I realized that what I was experiencing is not unique. It's going on all around the world and every, every local area, you know, indigenous people, spiritual practices all around the world ha have discovered the same things. And that's how I ended up getting into it. And as I progressed with my studies and um, began to do the practices and, and actually apply it to my life, that's when everything changed. So, that's basically my story in a nutshell, and I say a nutshell because there's a lot more detail in between, but that's who I am. That's a lot of the stuff that I went through. Here I am today. Uh, thanks for being here. And uh, I will. I, I do need to tell everybody that my time in the military and law enforcement gave me an edge. I mean, and when I say edge, I mean an abrasiveness, okay? I was dealing with, uh, you know, roughneck individuals, type A personalities, uh, criminals on the street. And so I, I, you know, and I'm also an instructor. Um, so I had to, I, I've got to tone it down a little bit. Um, when I'm talking, some people, from what I understand, uh, may feel a little intimidated or feel like I'm, I'm attacking them directly. And I promise you, I'm not. Um, but if, if you feel that way, I mean, I understand it. Okay. So anyways, uh, thanks for watching my story. Um, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below and, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you haven't done it, hit that like and subscribe button, help me grow the channel and I'll see you next time.